Hey everyone, just quick announcement before I share today's episode with Tim Kaufman. Tim is doing some amazing work and I'm excited for him to share his story. But just want to take a minute to share the release of my first children's book of my Healthy Children's Book series called Maddox's Trip to the Chiropractor. It's a cute book with bright pictures that follows a toddler on her trip to the chiropractor. It shows her excitement and how she knows that it impacts her health in a positive way. And each purchase of this book will be supporting a project that I started called the Unlock Wellness Project. For each purchase of the book, we will be donating a wellness bag to a child in need. These wellness bags will include non-toxic, chemical-free essentials such as soap, shampoo, toothpaste, a toothbrush, items that a lot of the time children in tough situations don't have access to. We're also going to be shipping the wellness bags to flood victims in Houston, Texas, and reaching out to victims of Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria as well. You can learn more about the book and about the Unlock Wellness Project by going to drkaseyjohnson.com. That's D-R-K-A-S-E-Y johnson.com. Click on the Shop tab, then click on the Children's Book option. You'll be able to read a short description and even watch a short video with more information. You can also purchase the book directly on Amazon.com by searching Maddox's Trip to the Chiropractor. But I hope you guys love the book. Be sure to check out my website to learn more. And thank you so much for the support. Now it's time for today's episode. I hope you love my conversation with Tim Kaufman. Welcome to the Unlock Wellness Podcast. I'm Dr. Casey and excited for today's guest. I'm here with Tim Kaufman and Tim has such an inspiring story. He's completely transformed his health and together him and his wife have lost 280 pounds and he just started implementing a plant-based diet, uh, started running more and you know when you follow him on social media it's really cool to see now because you'll see pictures of him doing like marathons and all these long runs and it's it's just extremely inspiring. So I'm excited for him to get to share his story. And um, Tim, just thank you so much for taking the time to come on. I'm honored to have you and just really excited for you to share your story with everybody. Thank you for having me, Dr. Casey. I really uh, appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. So, so Tim, just jump into your backstory and just what really, how did you really begin your wellness journey? I guess, where did you, I mean, where, first off, where, where did you grow up and like, what did your health look like younger? Yeah, I, I think uh, before the wellness journey, we have to get to the illness journey, really. Um, so I grew up, well, and I still live here in in a small, like, kind of rural town called Alden, and it's it's in New York. It's about twenty miles east of Buffalo, and um, it's kind of a farming community. That's kind of you know we grew up. There's a lot of farms around here, and you know, obviously, you know, twenty five years ago there were even more farms. So. Um, the community, that's kind of what you did. You know, you worked on a farm. And um, so I met my high school sweetheart in like eighth or ninth grade. And um, so things, you know, I I finished school and then I worked on a farm. And then I kept like twisting my ankle and like falling all the time and, and things like this. And I thought, you know, maybe I was just a klutz or clumsy or I didn't pay attention or you know, some people called me accident prone. Um, it seemed like, you know, I was always like spraining ankles, especially. And as I got older, um, you know, about 20, I got a job in a factory and then I got married to, you know, my high school sweetheart, which is now my wife, Heather. And I noticed in the factory, I was, I was probably because I was doing different movements than I had done before, like a lot of overhead lifting and stuff. And my shoulder kept dislocating. And um, it got to the point where I couldn't even keep it in the socket anymore. I'd actually sneeze and it would fall out of me. And I worked with like really heavy equipment and stuff. So um, it was dangerous actually to right. be dislocating all the time. So I went to the doctor particularly for my shoulder. And when, you know, they took some pictures of it and an MRI and it was like, it was in really bad shape. He had never seen anything like this before. So the short of it is he signed me up to get an arthroplasty. And so basically they went in there and they stretched all the 
tendons and ligaments up and then they like folded them yeah. and then stitched them back up to kind of tighten all the bands up if you will and when he got in there he started pulling on stuff and he noticed that something wasn't right it, everything was really like super stretchy like way more than it should be and um the surgery took like forever and they didn't really know what to do with it so they did the, the best they could do to patch it up but um what they found out is that i had a genetic condition and they di diagnosed me with something called eller stanlow syndrome mm. and actually i'm pretty lucky because there's uh five different types and i have the good one so i'm just hyper mobile so um, things like i would pull on a wrench and my hand would like separate at the wrist um really? Yeah, and, you know, as a kid, it probably wasn't, like, a big, big deal. But as I got older, um, I say older, in my 20s, I was already loaded with arthritis. Um, and my joints were really damaged because, you know, basically every time I would take a step, something was out of place. And in time, that really, like, chiseled away at my cartilage, and it really made a mess. So um, they actually told me, you know, in my early 20s that my knees were like old old people knees. And I had a doctor tell me that, you know, they wouldn't even do knee replacements because, and to quote him, it would be a waste of titanium because there was just nothing to put them back together with. So it wasn't so much a joint, it was what holds the joints together. But at any rate, um, what that kind of kicked things off for me um, because... On the way out of the hospital from that surgery, they sent me away with some Lortab. And I had never had a controlled substance in my life. And I can remember taking them and I couldn't believe right, right out of surgery how good they made me feel because I wasn't in pain. And that was kind of a new feeling for me not to be out of pain or at least right. have the pain masks or dulled, you know. Right. And that's so um, crazy too. I mean, at such a young age as well yeah i mean you know looking back i mean i'm kind of now i'm kind of a an advocate against all these uh pain prescriptions for chronic pain and right. i would have been on the opposite of the mic a few years ago but you know this was major surgery i mean they had me caught from basically you know the middle of my back all the way down my arm a huge incision i mean i was in pain i should have had pain medicine Right, right, right. Um, oh, uh, yeah. And I meant like that level of pain at such a young age. Just, it's just crazy. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And yeah, and it, you know, chronic pain. I, I feel like you know, it hurts so bad all the time that I just, I, I thought, well, that's what's supposed to happen. You know, you're, you know, if you ever sprained your ankle, you get that huge, you know, goose egg on the side. I mean, that's pretty much how I was all the time with something. Um. So I started on these painkillers and, you know, obviously you build up a tolerance and my body's really good at building up a tolerance. So, you know, what happened is the doctor said, look it, you got to keep your body as quiet as you possibly can. Um, my rheumatoid doctor said, do, you know, as little movements as you can because your joints are already trashed and, you know, they're on borrowed time. So you have X amount of movements left. Use them wisely. Um, so they taught me things like when I sit in a chair to make sure my arms are supported. So, you know, basically don't let my joints hang. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of immobil immobilizers. I, you know, I wasn't using crutches and canes at that point, but they basically, you know, set the foundation for me to do as little as possible. They told me to get out of the factory as soon as I possibly could. And, and Tim, what was your age at, at that exact time? I, I'm going to say somewhere, you know, maybe 23, 24 ish. And I'm totally right. guessing, but it, it was I mean, like, I mean, call like kind of right after college ish. I mean, like how was your mindset at that point? Because if somebody was telling you like, Oh yeah, you, I mean, limit your movements. Like you can't do this. You can't do that. Like, were you at like a stage of like helplessness or like what, where were you at like mindset wise? Because that seems like a pretty big order to be giving a young kid who's probably ready to see the world and go do all of these things. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. You know what? Cause I guess I didn't feel helpless because I still got around really good. I, I mean, I still worked a lot of hours. I still, I mean, I was still tough and, 
Um, what I think what shocked me more than anything, um, I, my, my family, my whole family is super hardworking people. My father, you know, was one of the hardest working guys I ever knew. And so it was my job to take care of my wife. I mean, that's what I signed up for. And it's, it's a long story and I don't want to get into it, but I actually, um, I actually dropped out of high school <laughs> to go to work into this factory. It was a really good job for the UAW. Um, and so when they told me that I should get a sedentary job, well, how do you do that without a degree? Right. So I actually had to go back to school. And since then I've earned like seven degrees, four of them are engineering. But that, that's a whole nother thing. Right. Um, but, but I can remember the, the thing that got me most wasn't so much the mobility. It was, I had a pediatric, this is a pediatric doctor. Um, cause it, this disease is kind of kind of rare and not a lot of people know about it. Um, so the only person that we had in the area that worked on um, connective tissue disorder was a pediatrician. And so he, I went into the office and on my second visit, he had all this paperwork drawn up for disability. Mm. And I remember that like hit home. I'm like, are you freaking nuts? Like I'm not even 25. There's no way I'm signing any of those papers. Right. And yeah, that, that probably hit me more than them telling me to sit still or whatever, because I probably didn't listen real well to that, but it was <laughs> in the back of my head, you know? Um, so what, what started happening is I, I kind of think like everything kind of came together to, I started doing less. And when I started doing less, uh, especially when I went into teaching, um, I didn't go back to college until probably into my, I don't know, early thirties. And so that whole thing where I'm sitting in a classroom and then I'm teaching, you know, I, I went to a super sedentary life. And so I started putting weight on and then the more weight I'd put on, you know, obviously the harder it is on my joints, maybe harder on normal people's joints, um, without the disease. But at the same time that was going on, I was in so much pain all the time. The older I got, the more arthritis I got. And um, the more weight I put on, the more pain it was in. So, you know, I won't take you through all the details, but I ended up, I started on the lower tabs, mm -hmm. which went up to the, like the max dose. And then I actually convinced the doctor to get rid of, you know, most of the acetaminophen because I, I was afraid of that. I wasn't afraid of the drug. I was afraid of the Tylenol. Um, and I had done my research on it, you know, and I, I thought I knew what I was doing, but I ended up, you know, then going to like Percocets, then Oxys. And, you know, in my mid thirties, I was on fentanyl and that was before like fentanyl was a thing. Like I, I had never heard of it. Right. And, you know, my doctor just said, you know, this stuff is like 40 times stronger than morphine. And I was on the uh, transdermal patch. So I had basically a constant supply of fentanyl. That's crazy. Did you have to like, I mean, at that point where like they pretty much just given you whatever you wanted or did you have to like doctor shop a little bit at that point? I know it's a little bit different than it is now. Like it's a little, some things are a little better regulated. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. A lot of things, actually I'm working with my County right now. Um, and a lot of things are, you know, much better regulated and technology has helped out a lot. Yeah. Um, when I got a script, it was my doctor writing a uh, prescription and you know, I, I don't want to get into all the details of it, but I got really good at manipulating to get what I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, and I got good at timing things to get, you know, so they go through at the same time and no one knows. And um, pretty much honestly, and, and I might be wrong about this, but it seemed with my experimenting that if I could get like the insurance company was more of a threat to me than any laws. Um, only that? because they wouldn't pay for like if they didn't have to pay for it, they weren't gonna. So it was totally a money thing. Right. Gotcha. Um and now, now I know 2009, um, just my pharmaceuticals alone were nineteen thousand four hundred dollars. It's very wow. close to twenty thousand dollars in the year two thousand nine. That's crazy. Yeah. So, you know, I did the fentanyl thing and then I was doing, um, like oxys for breakthrough and stuff, you know, stay ahead of the pain and yeah, it was a vicious cycle. And, 
and then I did something that I never thought I'd ever do in a million years. I never drank alcohol. You know, it wasn't in my family. Mm -hmm. Um, when the fentanyl wasn't enough and all the other painkillers weren't enough, um, I turned to alcohol and that was the fastest slope I've ever been down. Um, cause I didn't know what I was, I didn't know what was acceptable quantities. If that makes right. sense. Yeah. Were you, were you, and you were mixing alcohol with the medications, right? Yes. And, and I'm, I'm saying, you know, again, I didn't know because I'd never been to a bar. I still have never been to a bar, you know, like I didn't know what acceptable, like a one ounce shot or however many ounces. Like all I knew is that I was drinking just about a liter in like less than an hour. Cause I literally would take all my meds, wash them down with vodka. And then just, I would drink like three glasses, like, like you would water just so I could go to sleep. And you know, it wasn't so I could get a buzz or anything like it, it was literally, I just wanted sleep. to sleep, you know, that's yeah. all I wanted to do. Right. Cause that, I mean, man, that lack of sleep, it, it'll get you. I mean, I don't, I can't really, you know, compare my st story any close to yours, just total into the spectrum. But like, for example, like when I had a baby, like you were up for so much for days and like that type of exhaustion is unlike any kind of exhaustion you've ever had. Like whenever you're up with a newborn for weeks, like I can't imagine when you have so much pain and that's just part of your life. Like you can't function, like you can't be there for your friends and family. Like it's just, you're just, you're not fully there. So, I mean, I can empathize with the, the lack of sleep. Um, and then plus you had the pain added in, like that's just, it's just crazy. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's one thing if you're in pain for a day or two, or you can't sleep for a day or two, but when that's like the norm, you, you turn into someone you're not. And the other, you know, my favorite drug was food. Uh, food honestly gave me the same exact feeling as opioids. They made me feel really good, um, very temporary, but they gave me that, you know, comfort. And so um, I'm kind of fast forwarding, but like towards the end, you know, on top of the fentanyl, on top of the alcohol, on top of all the other uh, pills, I was going and getting fast food uh, three to four times a day. And mm -hmm. we ordered takeout, um, you know, four and five nights a week. Yeah, and that's, that's a lot. That was just our daily routine, you know. And that's, I mean, that's the daily routine of, of so many people, right? And doesn't it seem so like, it seems so crazy now, but I mean, that's, that's, that's the typical of so many families. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe not, maybe not that quantity, but I mean, you know what I mean? Just like just constant eating out and just constantly fast food. Yeah. You know, I just, I did a talk for some students, um, a couple of weeks ago and I actually, it's the first time I've ever done this. I put an average day, what it looked like for me on the screen. Mm -hmm. And I almost deleted the slide cause I was embarrassed, but you know, I told the kids, I'm like, it's not that I just woke up in the morning and said, I want to eat 8,000 calories in fast food. It's just was one bad decision after another one, after another one. And at the end of the day, that's what it looked like, you know? Mm -hmm. But so that's kind of, I'm, I'm going to kind of go back a little bit, but so that's kind of how I was eating and, you know, it all kind of snowballed. And basically my life consisted of doing as little as possible and um, trying to escape reality. And so I ended up at 38 years old. Um, I could hardly move. I had, I mean, our house looked like a hospital, literally. Like I had air cast and braces and crutches and canes. And, um, and you can imagine at 400 pounds, you know, physically what that is. I mean, it's kind of easy to imagine if you put 100 or 200 pounds on your back and try to go upstairs or you know, pick something up that you dropped. But what sometimes people don't understand is emotionally what that looks like and what that feels like. Um, I was supposed to be this tough guy, you know, to take care of Heather. And instead of doing my job, she's taking care of kids and she's outside mowing the lawn while I sit in the house with ice on my knees. And um, it really... It really, you know, I hate to use weighed a lot, but it really did weigh a lot on me. Mm -hmm. um, you can't help but be depressed. And um, there, you know, I tell people there, there were nights that I didn't know if I was going to wake up in the morning. 
Um, I had actually shut my kidneys down on at least three different occasions where my kidneys just like shut right off. And I was wow. petrified to go to the hospital, but I knew exactly what was going on. Um, and there were nights that, you know, I didn't know if I was going to wake up. And, and honestly, I don't even know if I really cared. Just in, just at a really low point. I mean, at that point, I mean, I mean, I can't imagine. I mean, because you, you literally can't do anything that you want to, basically. You know, you can't really be there for your family. And physically, I mean, you can't feel good. I, I mean, I, I can't imagine. No, and, you know, it, it becomes this thing where you're trying to do all you can to try to feel normal and you just can't feel normal. No matter how much you put into you, you just, you can't feel normal. And yeah, everything was dictated by me and we couldn't even go for a half an hour car ride because if I could get my knees to bend to get in the car, I would be so nauseous from, from all the medicines that we'd have to keep pulling over so I could, you know, literally throw up on the side of the road yeah. um you know and then and and then that snowballs too because you feel terrible because you know you're taken away from your family and you feel worse about yourself and you just like I was just tired I was just tired you know right so I mean you're going through all of that and then like how did that lead to some some type of like tipping point to where things started to change or was or was there a tipping point or like you know how did that kind of just continue to play out well, I think, you know, um, pe people want to hear tipping point and, and I right. get it. And I wish I could kind of just call out this one thing that spun everything back, but, um, it kind of didn't work that way. It's kind of a whole bunch of things kind of came together. And, um, <clears throat> really what I think, what I think got the ball rolling for me was, um, my wife's mom was diagnosed with leukemia and she was like such a special lady. She was, you know, growing up together, she was kind of like, we, I was at her house, she was at my house. So our parents were really close with us on both sides. And her mom is like the coolest lady in the world. And when she got diagnosed, our life, you know, really got flipped upside down because we wanted to spend as much time as we could. So, you know, instead of me going to work, coming home and perching on the couch for the night, it was getting up to, we have this place called Roswell where I live in. It's a huge cancer facility. And I had never, I mean, you hear people that have cancer, but it's always someone else. And um, I had never actually seen what that world looks like inside. And man, did we get a, a close up and personal look um, in the leukemia unit up there. And, you know, I can remember limping up the, you know, getting into the hospital, getting upstairs and limping up to my mother-in-law's bed. And she opened her eyes one night, super slow. I mean, she, it was, it was near, you know, her end of her battle and she was so tired and her job was to just hang on so she could live through the night. And she opened up her eyes and looked at me and she said, how's your knee? Wow. And I just, I was just crushed because that, that just like burrowed in me because when I left there, you know, she couldn't leave, but I could. And, you know, I, I saw all these kids upstairs playing and, you know, they all had masks on and they had like this double door for the airlock. So, cause their immune systems are all low. And I can remember walking out of there that night thinking I get to go home and, you know, my knees suck and there's a lot wrong with my life, but I'm walking out of here today. Right. And there's a lot more you could do to improve too. Yeah. Well, I had, I had got this, you know, I built this whole, you know, world around me that I could use all the stuff for an excuse. And I justified right. everything I did with the disease. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, you can't help but think, you know, somebody's getting their leg amputated because there's a tumor in it and I'm walking out of here on my own power. And tomorrow I'm going to get up and no one's going to have to change my bedpan. Yeah. And so I think if anything, um, that started showing me some gratitude and, and a little shift in perspective that, yeah, my life sucked, but it was good compared to other people's lives. Yeah. Um, so shortly, shortly after that, 
Um, we got a phone call. My father wasn't feeling well, and he went into the doctor for a routine checkup, and um, they thought he had pneumonia, and he ended up getting diagnosed with kidney cancer. Um, so they gave, they gave my father six months to live. And my father was everything to me. He was my best friend in the whole world. You know, you know, we hunted together, we fished together, we built stuff together. Um, super smart guy. He got me my job. We worked together for a while. And um, so two of our favorite, most beloved people in the world are both fighting with terminal cancer at the same exact time. Um, my father, my father uh, made it six weeks exactly to the day of his diagnosis. So, wow, um, so fast. Yeah, he passed away. And then um, my mother in law then lost her battle, which leukemia turned into lymphoma and then brain cancer. And she battled hard, but, you know, we lost her as well. Weird. So it pretty much just gave you like this, like this crazy new, like just gratitude for life and just knowing that you're better off than what you think and maybe there's hope. Yeah, no, that, and, and that was part of it, but I at least had that, I at least had that domino kind of tipped and, um, life is getting back to normal. And, and then, you know, of course, then I'm kind of using a little extra medicine to numb all, all the pain from losing them. And, um, I, my Heather, sometimes she would have to put my socks and shoes on in the morning and, and actually more often than not, she would have to. And, I can remember this one morning I was sitting on the kitchen kitchen uh, chair and she put my socks and shoes on and, you know, I looked down and I'm like, there's so much pain still, you know, we're trying to get back to normal, but that pain is still there. It's still fresh. And I looked into her eyes and I'm like, I'm the next one she's going to have to bury. Like we just went through two funerals, you know, a lot of the planning and a lot of the logistics. And I'm mm -hmm. like, she's going to be burying me next year. Like I knew it. Like I, there was no doubt in my mind that I was going to be dead within a year. And so it was the first time that I hadn't like really just thought about myself in the grand scheme of things, but I thought about Heather and I thought, what is her life going to look like? You know, how is she going to get through all this again for the third time? And, um, I remember, you know, I'm like, I have to do something. If, so my goal, honestly, was to just live another year because I knew that, you know, even if I lived another year of the path that was going on, you know, what would it look like? I'm 400 pounds. Right. I can't get my socks and shoes on me. I can hardly get in and out of my vehicle. Right. You know, what's life going to look like for right. her? It's just like, yeah, I mean, like not a high quality of life for sure. Yeah. And, and the way things were progressing, it's like, where is this all going to end? You know, yeah. and, I, and I knew where it was going to end. And so did my doctor. So I decided to do something and I went online and I researched um, bariatric surgery. So I found a place here in the, in Buffalo that would do the surgery and I got the packet in the mail and I did, you know, all the paperwork sent that in. I went to a couple meetings. We had a date all picked out. And all I had to do was get the okay from my primary, mm -hmm. which should have been pretty easy. And he wouldn't sign on it. He just, he wouldn't do it. And he was a super big advocate of the surgery because it had helped people. Um, but he wouldn't sign for mine because number one, I was on so much medicine that he was really worried about the anesthesia. Mm -hmm. And I was also on a beta blocker and calcium channel blocker, the max of both of them. And my blood pressure was still, um, it averaged like 255 over 115 up in there. And he was always worried I was going to have like a stroke because my resting heart rate was also like 125. Wow. And so I was in bad shape and he was really worried about me. And he said, you can't do it. You just can't sign off. He goes, I won't do it. So I honestly, I came home and I thought, that's it. I'm dead. But, but at the same time, I remember going to bed that night thinking, I just watched, you know, Heather's mom fight for everything she had to try to be around for her kids. Mm -hmm. And I watched my dad battle and it's like, I got to at least try, you know, I got to at least try. So I think I did what, you know, most Americans do to lose weight. And, you know, I started 
cutting the carbs out and Correct. restricting calories. Mm-hmm. And um, which I'm sure worked at that weight. Yeah, at 400 pounds, I mean, pretty much right. anything you do. I mean, if you if you get rid of you know one fast food meal a day, I'm sure something would have happened. Right. But so yeah, I would you know I kind of at least if anything, I was kind of conscious of what I was eating. Um, so I guess that was a, another domino that kind of tipped and, and I did, I did see results. Um, I felt better, you know, with the last, when my doctor weighed me, you know, being over 400, they couldn't really get an accurate weight on me. Um, and so we interviewed my doctor last year and he said, I was well over 400. I don't know what that means, but I like to just call it 400. <laughs> right. Um, so I started losing weight and then one day I was um, watching Netflix and this, I saw this title fat sick and nearly dead. And I'm like, man, that describes me pretty much. (laughs) It's an awesome documentary. Yeah. So I watched it and you know, if you know anything about it, Joe cross comes to the U S from Australia and he spends 60 days um, consuming nothing but vegetable and fruit juice from his juicer and through the, it was super inspirational film. And by the end of it, he had lost like almost 60 pounds. Um, he'd got rid, rid of almost all his medicine that he was on. Oh yeah. And helped others do it too. So, you know, you're seeing all these cool stories. Yeah. Super inspiring. And, you know, I have no idea like why I did this, but before the movie was over, I had already ordered a juicer from Emma. <laughs> it's awesome. And like I say, you know, for me, because I look back and it had nothing to do with nutrition to me at all. It uh, Honestly, it didn't matter if it was, you know, raccoon poop that you put in. Like, <laughs> I just knew that he had results. I didn't care what the results were from. Mm-hmm. I just knew it worked. And it didn't matter what it was. I wanted what he had. Um, because, <laughs> you know, like my life, like on the weekends, like what we did is – we made sausage. That's what we did. I mean, sometimes we would process 300 pounds of sausage on the weekend. That's how I grew up. Wow. <laughs> That's um, so much. Yeah. I had like two, two smokers going in my backyard all the time. You know, we had, we, we raised our own pigs, our own cows. You know, we, we did all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was my two food groups for meat and cheese. So I never even gave it a thought that this was any different than I ate. It's just, I wanted to do what he did. So, you know, I, I get the juicer and January 1st is coming. In fact, it'll be six years. It's coming January. It's coming up and I'm like, I'm going to try 30 days, you know, no no dabbling or anything. And it's probably good that I didn't. I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. And, um, yeah. So so at 1159, almost six years ago, I, my last meat that I've ever eaten is uh, two pieces of pickled herring out of a jar. <laughs> <laughs> that's so gross. <laughs> totally disgusting. Oh, it's just man. A, well, that's uh, a good way to end it, I guess, like on something <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> yeah, but um, I don't know, a T-bone steak or something. Probably right. <laughs> but whatever. Um, I had no idea that was the last meat I'd ever sure. eaten. So I went, I went to the store, and I picked up like a bag of produce, and – you know, here I am still, still close to 400. I was definitely over 350. And I, I put this, you know, bag of produce in the juicer and now comes like a quarter cup of juice. And I'm like, (laughs) but they say like a teaspoon. Yeah. We got a problem. Yeah. It takes a lot. (laughs) But That's cool though. Cause I mean, I'm, I'm sure that taught you a lot about like just different foods because that's something you don't know at first is like, when you use a juicer, it takes a lot. Like it's just different. And then the different food groups that you use and different mixes and I'm just sure, I'm sure that whole experience though as a whole was like just really educational for you and just like just that whole learning curve of the process that you were going on. Yeah, for sure. And you know, if, if the biggest thing that it did was first of all, teach me, like I didn't know kale was a thing, you know, I didn't know. (laughs) And, um, the, the biggest thing it did is it showed us how to shop. I had never shopped. Um, that was, you know, and if Heather shopped, it will be like, you know, go get like pizza rolls or a frozen something. It was something in a box that was mm-hmm. usually frozen. And so, you know, by the end of this, I'm, I'm like excited. Hey, did you see carrots are on sale? We got to go get, you know, and you know, not only that, I'm starting to buy stuff from like, like produce companies and actually restaurant suppliers, you know, getting 50 pounds of carrots shipped in. That's awesome. Canada. 
that's a really good idea too. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it started teaching me to shop and I got excited at when I'd find deals, you know, um, you know, I did, I'd work out deals with some of the local, you know, produce companies, you know, I'd, I'd be like, well, what do you guys do with the kale? That's a little wilted. You know, and I and they would give it to me sometimes for free. So we were getting like boxes of stuff. And so if anything, it did that. But I remember, you know, on about the fifth day, um, I I can remember the first three days were hell. Like they were just terrible. I almost quit like a hundred times. It's just straight detox. Yeah, detox. I was hungry, man. I wanted food so <laughs> bad. And but what I kept doing is kind of the same way that I quit smoking. You know, I'd go, well, if I quit now, I just wasted all that torture of the past two days. So right. let me just hang in a little bit more. Some nights I just went to bed. So like some, it'll be like six o'clock. I'd be like, I can't deal with this. I'm going to bed. Um, but by day five, the hunger had subsided. And I'll never forget. I, I got goosebumps sitting here right now. I've told this a hundred times. I woke up in the same spot I went to bed and I, I hadn't had a night's sleep in so long that I forgot what that felt like. Man. And that's, this that's is so day awesome. five. Yeah. And things started changing, you know, every day I'd notice something new, you know, I'd notice that, whoa, I forgot to take my medicine or, you know, whoa, I forgot to add in the tramadol today. And you know, little by little, I was feeling better. I was getting more energy and um, I was thinking better, but I screwed up all along the way. I, I can remember, you know, having a, a dip of Copenhagen chewing tobacco in my mouth and remembering how well it went with the taste of kale, you know, like pairing it with <laughs> kale. Um, Are you creating like a new, like, uh, <laughs> it's just like a wine pairing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. It's it's funny, but you yeah. know that's that's where I was. I mean, that's what I didn't know anything. You know, I just knew that this was working, and you know. So, but I also knew that you know, as as good as I felt, that thirty days is okay. But I mean, I cannot do this the rest of my life. I have to figure something out. And because I watched uh, Fat Sick and Nearly Dead, mm -hmm. Netflix put in my queue that I might like uh, Forks Over Knives. And so I watched Forks Over Knives, and after I watched it, I literally got back to the beginning, and I watched the whole thing again. That's awesome. And I sat on the couch, and I'm thinking, either this entire film is the biggest pile of bull crap ever, or people should go to jail. Because I didn't know, I mean, I just watched two of my favorite people in the world die from cancer, and then you have Dr. Campbell saying that you can turn cancer on and off. And it's mm -hmm. like, what is wrong? Why don't people know about this? Like, what is wrong with this? But in watching that, you know, I got to the point where, well, okay, this isn't that big of a deal. It's been almost 30 days. I'm not dead. And what if I just eat what I'm putting in my juicer? Um, that's pretty much what they're doing. And again, I had no clue what plant-based. I had no, like, I didn't know any of this stuff. Right. You're just, you're just seeing what works from like these films and like just, just trying it out. Right. Yeah. And I think if I would have known, I probably wouldn't have done it. I mean, I, I literally, you know, have dead animals tattooed on my body. So I'm the worst vegan in the world. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but so, so at any rate, when that was over and then, you know, because I watched Forks Over Knives, all these other things started coming up and um, I found all these breadcrumbs that I started chasing down and I bumped into, you know, Dr. McDougall's page and, you know, and then I got, you know, I was doing kind of a lot of greens and um, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I knew I was hungry. I was losing a lot of weight, but I was really hungry. And then I got into the, you know, putting the starches in there and it all kind of, you know, I just kept experimenting with stuff and, um, you know, I just felt better and better and started dropping more and more weight. And it just kind of, everything that kind of snowballed forward, kind of unsnowballed. Yeah. And I mean, at the same time, your, your wife is implementing this way of eating too, right? Cause I know she's had a pretty significant weight loss as well. Right. Yeah, but no, <laughs> she was not implementing it. Um, I, you know, and I don't know if she thought, well, I, I don't, I can't blame her for this. She probably just thought it was a passing thing that I was doing, but <laughs> right. probably for the first three years here, um, 
you know, the kid, she will bring pizza home. Pizza and wings were like our staple food mm -hmm. from Buffalo. So you got to have wings. Um, and I would eat my, you know, sweet potato wedges and my greens and my beans. <laughs> and, but what would happen is she would see my sweet potatoes come out of the oven and she'd be snatching them off the cookie sheet <laughs> and, you know, thinking, wow, this, this is good food. Um, and I, I honestly think, you know, for her, I don't think she had the relationship with food that I did uh, for her. It was totally convenience. I mean, you know, she, she runs her own business, two, two kids to take care of and, you know, me basically taking care of me. So it, it was totally convenient. You could call, they, they actually, the pizza place knew who we were when we called um, and they knew exactly what we were going to order before we ordered it. So it was super convenient. Right. And, and I don't, I, you know, I, I don't think she looked at food like I looked at food as this escape. She just looked at it, it it's made and I don't have to deal with it. But so so she joined me probably I mean, I guess she was like partially plant based, you know, kinda progressively. And then um she ran into a health issue a couple of years ago that, you know, she she got a big scare and she made a decision that she's all in. And I gotta be honest with you. She's way more strict than I am, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll sneak, I'll sneak like an oil-free pretzel, and she'll be looking at me, and she'll be like, "Really? You That's know, there's salt funny. on it, right? Really?" <laughs> so. That's awesome. Well, now you have somebody to help keep you in, in in check with even the little stuff. So that's that's always good. Yeah, yeah, it's it's fun. It's it's you know, it's kind of cool to see that because I changed so many people around me have that's it kind of yeah. makes me feel good but so yeah so what happened is that the better I ate you know the more results I got and then these stupid things will be coming up as like like the tobacco and the kale it's like all right if I'm worried about my health and I'm trying to get healthy like tobacco is probably not the best way to do it although it's a plant it's probably not the best thing <laughs> Okay. So, you know, you start making these, well, if I'm putting all this investment into myself, I got to kind of get rid of this. And, you know, in time, um, I'm in the public sector. I, I was very humiliated and embarrassed um, about my addiction and, and, you know, my alcoholism. And, and honestly, it's been a long, it's been a long time since I actually just talked about it. But um I should have went to a clinic and I'm totally like, I'm a hundred percent convinced if you have an addiction problem, you need to get help and you need to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, not kind of the way I did it. Cause like I said, I was so embarrassed that I didn't want to. And so what I did is every time I put a new fentanyl patch on, I would cut about a 16th of an inch off of it before I put it on. And then the next time I change it, which is 36 hours later, I, I will cut, you know, an eighth of an inch off. And I, and I just kept, kept doing that until one day I went to put the patch on and it was actually uh, smaller than the slivers I had been cut in. So That's that awesome. was a pretty, pretty special, pretty special day. I'm sure it was. That's just incredible. And then like, so you, you're, you're feeling a whole lot better. The weight's coming off. So when did the, the running come into play? Because I'm sure that's something that you could have never even imagined for yourself, especially with all of the knee problems that you, that you had, the pain that you had. So, you know, when did the, the fitness aspect start to really come into it for you? Yeah, it was, it was all accidental. Um, it started, honestly, it started with a walk and, you know, Heather asked me to go for a walk and I thought something was broke on the car and, and I didn't, <laughs> didn't understand the concept of walking just to go walk. Right. Okay. Didn't make sense to me. But, right. So I ended up, uh, I ended up going on that walk and we were supposed to walk a mile and a half. You know, we have these like railroad tracks that they turned into trails by us and, um, so nice flat, you know, you know, I wasn't supposed to be walking to begin with that much, but at least I was on a flat surface and, um, I didn't make it to three quarters of a mile to the turnaround. I actually, I actually, uh, had to stop and it took me almost an hour to get to three quarter mile in. And, um, Heather had to go back and get the car and come pick me up. And I almost went to the emergency room that night. My knees were so swollen. I mean, they were like basketballs and wow. you know, I just packed them in ice. And what's your, what's your weight at at this point, Tim? Um, I was still pretty big, you know, I, I was still, you know, this kind of happened 
like kind of everything kind of blended together. So I'm not, I'm not going to say that I finished my juice fast, started plant-based like that. It's kind of, I'm sure the the walk, the walk actually might've been even before um, the juicing started, you know, but, but similar, I mean, close enough, right? Yeah. It was all kind of the same thing, you know, cause I felt better and I wanted to, you know, I felt like I should be off the couch, but um, so after I came home and, and packed my legs down and for some reason, you know, a couple of days later, I wanted to take that walk again and see if I could get to the road and get back. And, you know, I did. And um, we started walking a little bit more and, you know, a mile turned into two and then four. And uh, awesome. I also, you know, I've been an outdoorsman my whole life. And, uh, and the last place I should be with EDS is on uneven ground. But I grabbed a pair of hiking shoes and um, I decided to start hiking and, you know, same kind of deal there. I'd, I'd walk a, you know, half mile through the woods and, you know, I set it up so I would be stranded on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> um, I knew, you know, I, if I figured I could do four miles, what I would do is I would walk out, you know, I would walk out to four miles and then say, there, you got your four miles and now, you know, get back. And it was ugly sometimes. And, you know, I actually had like a a little kit that I'd carry with me with ace bandage and sports tape. And um, I actually took trekking poles so I could use them, you know, to get back if I had to. But yeah, so little by little, I I started getting more active just with walking and walking super slow. Mm -hmm. And then um, my friend came back from the Adirondack High Peaks here in New York. And um, some of the pictures from the summit were just they were mind blowing and I could like feel his excitement, you know, that he had summited his first high peak. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to get up one of those mountains by next year. And, um, you know, I could, I still was having trouble with stairs. You know, I'd come up like 10 stairs and I'd be like dead. Right. And so, but I knew, you know, I knew if I could keep climbing stairs, I'd just do a few more stairs than I'd done the day before. Mm-hmm. And it kind of like, it kind of went so fast. Like within a month, I went from like 10 stairs to like 200. Wow. Um, just by adding a couple more every day. And, you know, I was on a mission. It wasn't about getting up the stairs. I wanted that mountain and I knew the only way I could do it is uh, to keep climbing up stairs. Um. Yeah. So, so before you knew it, you know, instead of counting the stairs, I had to use time because I would lose count. But, um, so I ended up, uh, I went to my doctor and I said, look at, I can't have these immobilizers anymore. You got to get me braces that I can actually move in. And so they casted my legs and sent the castings to California. And, um, I got some proper braces that actually bent. And so, in 2012, I actually summited my first high peak big slide mountain. Awesome. That's awesome. Were you, were you like so excited to tell your doctor like, hey, I climbed the mountain? Because, <laughs> because they probably would have never, ever predicted that. Yeah. yeah he, my doctor's been awesome. That's a whole nother. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually, I actually work with them now and That's to help awesome. people. And when people want to get to surgery, um, they have to talk to me first and they have to wait 60 days after they talk to me. So, <laughs> That's amazing. And you know, so far, everyone that comes over, I, I usually have people over for dinner and, um, you know, within 30 days, they won't qualify for the surgery anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so it's super cool. But That's amazing. Well, so the mountain was kind of super important because standing up there, I just, I couldn't help think that, you know, this was impossible. And that day, like something impossible became possible. And like, it's one thing to walk a few miles, but when, you know, someone in my shape and where I was to get up a mountain and I was still big, I I, I was probably still 300 pounds when I got up there or, or close to it. Um, and it took me forever. It was the hardest thing I've ever done, but I made it, you know, and I came home and I said, Heather, you've got to see this place. So, you know, since then, you know, I've taken her and the kids and we've climbed a bunch of mountains together and it's our favorite place. Lake Placid is like our favorite place to hang out. It's awesome. Um, 
And then, so the short of it, I'm going to shorten this stuff up. But so then I saw an advertisement for Tough Mudder on TV and I told Heather that we should do that. And she said, no, I'm not getting muddy. I got my shirt. <laughs> so I called her sister and brother-in-law and they said they'd do it. So I knew Heather'd have to do it too. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so we finished at Tough Mudder and um, our plan was to kind of walk, briskly walk it, which you can do. But it's like 13 miles or something. And, you know, I told Heather I was feeling so good that we did a little bit of jogging. And I said, hey, we should run a 5K. And she goes, isn't that like a marathon? And I'm like, <laughs> it's close, but I think we can do it. So, right. you know, that's, we started, you know, and I don't even know what our pace was, but we just kind of trotted along and we'd have about six water stops <laughs> on a 5k loop but you know we stop we walk and um we work super super hard and so we crossed our first like I never had a bib or a finish line none of that stuff I'd never seen a race before uh -huh. and so we crossed the finish line of our first 5k and it was like one of the most emotional times in my life we were crying so hard that people thought something happened or we got bad news or something. And it was just a big moment for you guys. I mean, especially after everything that you both had been through and just a big turnaround point. I mean, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. It was for both of us. It was like crazy. And you know, from there I, I said, well, let's do a 10 K. And she said, no, we almost died on that. <laughs> and you know, a couple months later we crossed the finish line of our first 10 K and um, then I asked her to do a half marathon with me and she said, no way. <laughs> so I had a handicap parking pass on my dresser and it was actually due September, 2014. That was due to expire. And it was the same month of a, a pretty big half marathon race that we have here, the mighty Niagara, where it runs like the, from Niagara falls down the river kind of thing. And I thought, man, how cool would it be to park in a handicapped spot legally and go run a half marathon? Like, I thought that would be <laughs> so crazy. Yeah. And so I knew it was going to be super tough. So what I did is I took that handicap pass and um, I got a picture of my dad and her mom and my family and a friend that was struggling with cancer printed out. And I taped it to the back of that pass and I tied it around my waist and... I finished the half marathon with it. So super special day for me. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And you know, by mile three, the whole bottom fell out. All my plans had changed and it was a, it was a suffer fest for, for the most part, but I got it done, you know, and, and that was another cool thing. Like who would have ever thought, you know, that'd be doing a half marathon and I don't know. I just kept doing more and more stuff. And I ran another half marathon and then I decided to take on a full marathon. Did Heather do that one with you or is it just yourself? No, it was just me. She thought I was nuts, <laughs> you know, right. And, you know, but well, actually before I, I did the full marathon, um, in fact, it was last year, September, she asked me to pace her for her first half. And it was like, it was so cool, you know, and she runs way too happy. I'm you know, <laughs> at the finish line. I'm miserable. I just went over with it and she was smiling. It was just a, such a cool experience. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I paced her and since then, um, I can't keep up with her. So she just smokes me every time now. That's awesome. That's awesome. I mean, so you, I mean, you've done a lot of, of races since then, right? Have, have you done more than, um, more than a full marathon? No, no, that, that's hopefully, well, it might be fe February. I'm not sure. But so, yeah, so then I, I signed up for the Buffalo full and uh, the news, the local news picked it up. Um, one of the writers from the newspaper, you know, found, I guess his wife found my blog or something and mm -hmm. they took an interest in my story. So um, it was really neat. We made the front page of the, the Memorial Day uh, paper. We made the front page and it was a huge, like two page spread, beautiful job. Cool. And I had never seen my story written out before, told like that. And it was amazing. Um, it was a, the hottest day on record um, for the marathon. And at mile 18, my whole body had, my, I was, my hands swelled up so much that it actually bent the pins on my Garmin watch. Wow. Um, and I told Heather, I said, I'm not going to make it. And whew, I'm going to start crying again. 
um, she was standing there meeting me at mile 18. She was giving me, you know, stuff. I had her pack a little bag and we had these meeting points already set up and mile 18. I said, man, I, I can't do this. And she literally like right there, she dropped the bag she was carrying. Mm -hmm. Um, and she ran, she, she ran the last eight miles with me. So that's awesome. Just really helped you. I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure like, you know, especially in a race like that long, like, I mean, you reach a point and then somebody joins you. It just, just, I mean, I'm sure that was just really lifting. Yeah. No, I felt like I was dying the whole time, but yeah, I mean, I wouldn't <laughs> have got it through it without her, you know, she <laughs> right, walked right. me through it and took her time. It took me forever. Um, so yeah, so that was cool. And then, you know, from there I ended up, I learned how to swim last year and I did a, a half Ironman here a couple cool. months ago and, um, we're, we're setting up here in five days to run her first marathon, which will be ours together. That's awesome. Um, where's that, where's that one at? That one is called the Niagara International. So it's actually the only marathon in the world that starts in one country and finishes in another. Nice. That's awesome. So, yeah. It's going to be fun. Cool. Well, tell her I said good luck, but I'm sure she'll do amazing and excited to see her, uh, all the pictures and results on Facebook. That'll be really cool. Yeah. So it's just, it's, it's been fun, but you know, it, that stuff is all super cool, but you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, that sounds good. And that's what everyone, you know, makes them feel all warm and fuzzy, but you know, the stuff that matters to me is, is, you know, being able to share those experiences with her. And, you know, we climbed Mount Washington last year and it was just so cool standing, you know, on the highest peak of the East coast with her. And I'm thinking, it wasn't long ago she was putting my socks and shoes on and and mowing the grass for you like yeah and here we are at the summit cone of washington like it just that stuff's awesome and you know the the drugs and alcohol and all that stuff's been you know it's not only gone it's replaced with me helping people how to do this in my community you know and mm -hmm. i think that's the stuff that that you know makes me happy Right. I mean, just, I mean, cause yeah, cause you know, the, like, the families that are going to be affected by that person not getting the surgery and like changing their diet because that changes their entire family's diet. It's just, it, it, it's really cool. And it's, um, you know, it's just inspiring and just to empower other people like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, giving back is, is such a huge part of this. And so, you know, everyone wants to always know, well, do you still have EDS? Yes, I do. Um, my legs, like if I wiggle my knees to the side, it's really gross and it makes a lot of people want to heave, but yeah, my, my joints are floppy, you know, they, but the, the thing now, what I've learned is, um, the biggest thing is, and, and I believe that it's not just EDS. I, I think it's most chronic diseases are caused from inflammation. Mm -hmm. And if you go online and you search up um, anti-inflammatory diets, what you're going to find is that plant-based is pretty much as is, is anti-inflammatory as you can get. Exactly. The food that I was eating before is the biggest contributor of inflammation. And that would be the meat, the dairy, and the oil, and the processed sugars and foods um, were all, you know, huge contributors to the inflammation. So now, you know, when I sublox or dislocate a little bit, I get zero inflammation. Um, and what, you know, and I still, once in a while, I'll step on a, a pine cone the wrong way and I end up, you know, spilling on the ground. Um, I get up and walk it off where before, you know, that was something that it would take me a week on crutches for the swelling to go down. So right. just the whole healing mechanism is just so enhanced. For sure. And the, you know, greens, you know, I try to eat a ton of greens. And so the inflammation factor is, is kind of out of the equation for me. Mm -hmm. Um, the atrophy is gone because I'm moving and I got back a lot of range of motion. Um, it's not perfect. And, you know, things like swimming and stuff, I kind of, I kind of swim a little weird because, you know, I, I lost some, some use of my shoulder, but you know, what helped me the most is strength. Um, so before I couldn't really couldn't get a piece of chalk off the ground. And now, you know, I have a 500 pound deadlift awesome. and that's super important to keep because what happened and this was totally, you know, by accident. Um, I shouldn't say by accident. I don't believe in coincidence, but it was unintended. As I got stronger, my muscles start taking over where my joints are weak. So, 
you know, if I'm really focused on what I'm doing and I'm really like when I run, I'm really thinking about straight lines and in perfect form. Mm -hmm. um, I can, I can do a lot of stuff. Yeah. That's, I mean, your body's so smart and can compensate in the right way, but you just didn't have the ability before to even, I mean, to even like, you know, function in the right way to really perform in the right way. So that's, I mean, that's cool. It's interesting. Yeah. And stuff, you know, everyone sees, and I almost hate putting this stuff out there, but everyone sees like the running and, you know, the swimming and, and, you know, the crazy 21 mile per hour bike rides for 50 miles. Like, and that stuff's cool. Um, but that's, that's the thing is it's about a nursing home. Like the, the whole activity thing should not be about, you know, a PR or your Garmin. You know, I try to explain to people cause I work with a lot of like, we'll say, we'll call them middle age, like upper middle age people in my classes mm -hmm. and to tell someone, yeah, to show a picture of an Olympic, you know, squat lifter, <laughs> you know, right. they say, well, why would I squat? Well, you need to squat so you can get off the toilet right? because the truth is that's why you're going to go in the nursing home. You know, you're going to get in the nursing home because you can't take care of yourself. You can't get off the floor. If you end up on the floor, you can't, you know, get out of bed. So, you know, the activity thing is not this glamor cross and finish lines. It's because, you know, in 20, 30 years from now, I don't want someone taking care of me. And right. if that just means doing a couple chair squats every day, then that's what we need to do. Absolutely. No, I love it. And I love that you're hitting that aspect of it and not just the, um, the sports factor. Because, I mean, obviously they go hand in hand. But, yeah, you're just trying to avoid staying out of that system altogether. I love it. And, yeah, and, and Tim, I know that you're, you, you're doing a lot of positive work. You have your blog, which is, I mean, I'm sure super just empowering for you know, these people as well. Like, you know, what are you – do you have anything coming up in the future that you're working on, any projects or – um, I know you're talking about your wife's race, but do you have one coming up as well? Well, I want to get her through the the marathon. I don't yeah, know. I'm. Yeah. I feel like it's. I'm about to do something real stupid. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't want to put it out there yet. I have okay. my. I have a real passion. Um, been talking to a lot of high schoolers. I have a really uh, a deep passion for opioid addiction, especially mm -hmm. with these kids, because. You know, the kids don't understand when they grab, and I know this has nothing to do with your podcast. But oh, no, no, you're good. I, yeah, you're good. The, the kids, they don't, and, and I don't think adults understand because it comes in a prescription bottle from your doctor. Um, you think that it's not the same thing as sticking a needle in your arm with heroin, but it's the same class of drugs. Yeah. And, you know, I believe there's a genetic disposition for um, a super addictive personality, which I have been blessed with. Um, I can't ever buy a lottery ticket because I'll lose my house tomorrow. But I know that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Um, so the problem is people take these drugs from their doctors and they think they're 100% safe and they're not. Um, and I believe there's a place for them. And I'm not going to argue that there isn't. But... Right now, we have 13-year-old kids leaving their dentist with lower tabs for braces, like not wisdom teeth, just for braces. And I feel like it's become part of the just protocol. When someone visits you, you get the, well, it's not a prescription pad anymore, but it's just what happens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the thing is, even if they're prescribed for a legit thing, you know, Grandma Brown has these bottles because she doesn't want to throw anything out. And then the grandkids go over there at 13, 14 years old, and they know there's a party next week, and they take them there. And, you know, for some people, it sounds so stupid. They take them out of their grandma's medicine cabinet. But I see the end result as right. a kid on heroin. Like, I get that. I see where that goes because I that should never happen to me. Like, I'm not that kind of person. I never woke up one day, and I tell the kids this, I never woke up one day and said, you know what, when I get older, my goal in life is to be a 400 pound opioid addict that's an alcoholic and can't take care of himself. That was never my goal. And, and I don't think anybody sets out to do that kind of stuff, but right. it happens over bad choices. So anyways, I'm very passionate about, um, we have a program here called kids escaping drugs. Um, and somehow I want to tie in uh, my first ultra race, um, to kind of, to kind of, first of all, bring awareness. Second of all, 
I want to do some uh, miles in memory of people. Mm -hmm. And then I would like to have some kids in recovery, maybe pace me. So I, I, it's just, it's just a thing I have in my mind. I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it work. Um, but it's just an idea I have. No, I love that. And you know, it's, um, yeah, that, I mean, that addiction problem is it's, it's scary and it, it really is like super, uh, just rampant right now. I mean, have you seen, I'm sure you, have you seen stuff about the documentary on Netflix? Um, it's called hair. I think it's called heroin. Um, Mm, but it, it no, it, it is called heroin, and okay, I cool. haven't seen it. And someone told me that I need to watch it. Yeah, and like the town that they did that in in Huntington, West Virginia, it's like thirty minutes from where like I grew up because I grew up in West Virginia. So it's like hearing the stories, like you know, just on my Facebook feed all day, just from people that people you know posting it about stories in the hometown. Like it's just it's crazy over there. I know it's crazy everywhere, but it's just like it's insane to see, especially these young kids, because like. I mean, it's a real problem over there. And I, I haven't seen the documentary yet either. I need to. Um, but no, I think, I think that's an amazing project. And um, yeah, I'm excited to, to watch that through for you. What, what blew my mind is I started, I do some work for the, I call it work. I do some speaking, you know, volunteer speaking um, at the county, the wellness um, uh-huh. department. So, and I'm talking about plant-based food and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but I call them up because in my high school talks, um, kids don't really care too much about cholesterol, although we do talk about it. But I really want to use the opportunity to talk about addiction, suicide, depression, and self-worth. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to get some statistics. And after I was done with the lady, I was like sick to my stomach because um, she gave me all this information. And what blew my mind is that here we are, I told you I'm kind of in a rural place. You'd think that the problem for opioid like overdose and addiction is in the urban areas, but you could not be more wrong. It's actually in very affluent um, middle to upper class um, white males from 30 to 35. That's Mm -hmm. like the target. And it's like, it's crazy. It, it just, it blows my mind how, like, it's a problem and no one talks about it. It's terrible. Right. Yeah. No, and I, that's, that's amazing that you're, that you're going to do that. And I, yeah, I, I love that. And just any way to make a positive influence with that, because like you were saying, like, you just, you don't know how they, nobody plans to do that. Maybe it's because of their braces or their football injury. And like, it just leads to a problem and yeah, it doesn't matter. I mean, you could have a lot of money, you could have no money, but either way, it's like, okay, you know, Sally is addicted to drugs because she had pain when she had braces. Like that's, that's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's more, honestly, um, it's more, you know, I didn't want to feel like an idiot at a party. Like everyone else has taken this pill. So, yeah. you know, I did. And we talk about that. There's many roads to addiction. Chances are pain is not going to be their road. It's going to be peer pressure. But so I get into all that. Another project, um, that, that we have that's super exciting. We just finished uh, shooting the last person this weekend for a film called uh, Big Change the Film. And Josh is actually in that with that's me, cool. uh, Nalita Benson and Denise um, Norris, which I'm, I'm super excited. Um, that's going to be, I, I can't wait to see what that looks that's like. Awesome. I've actually thought I'd be talking to both of those, uh, uh, Nalita and um, Denise really soon. So Put I'm Jason honest. Cohen on your list too, because cool. he's the he's the brains behind the operation, and um, he's lost 120 pounds himself. Awesome! Yeah, I'll definitely will. Awesome! I'll get I'll get that contact from you afterwards. But yeah, for sure. Awesome! Cool! Yeah. So um, so Tim, what is the best way for people to follow you on social media? That way, they can keep up with all the amazing work that you're doing, and um, yeah, just keep up with all the races, all the um, all the classes that you're doing, just just everything. So social media, websites, all of that. Yeah, well, pretty much if you search anything fatmanrants.com, you'll find me. So um, my blog is kind of sitting there. There's a lot of, I think there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, more, you know, like how my thinking process, which is kind of scary sometimes um, because I'm supposed to be writing a book. And that's I'm, cool. Yeah, it's cool, but I can be dis, I can get up at 3 30 in the morning and go run, but for some reason, I'm having <laughs> trouble getting discipline writing. Um, I have a lot done, but I need to get more done. Um, and then, so my Instagram pretty much, I just use, I park my food there. So (laughs) I, I try to like 
show people that it doesn't have to be fancy. I mean, I do fancy once in once in a while, but most of the time my food is just food. It's, you know, it's good, but it's not like you don't need exotic. Artwork. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, right. here's greens, dump some beans on them and eat and get to your next thing, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, no, I'm I'm making it oversimplified. It, my food is awesome. I'm a That's all. <laughs> Um, but it's super simple. And then uh, my Facebook page is fat, fatmanrants.com. That's my uh, public page. Mm-hmm. And I honestly, I don't put a whole bunch of fitness activity stuff um, because I really think it's important. I try to put stuff on there um, that I would have maybe thought about when I was 400 pounds. So gotcha. if I, you know, if I put on there, you know, hey, I got my training run in today. We did a slow 10 miler <laughs> right. like at 400 pounds of it. I'm like, dude, I, there, I can't do that. So I really focus on the food more because I, I believe the food is the key. And for me, the fitness is just a byproduct of how good I feel. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, well, for too many years, we've been trying to, you know, hit the gym on, in January and burn off calories. And it, it just, mm-hmm. it's a bad deal. Like, you know, the thermodynamics, they don't work. It's, you got to fix your food and then everything else will fall. And then the lastly, um, my, my personal page, um, my personal Facebook is Tim Kaufman. And and then, then I do post some of my fitness stuff. Gotcha. Perfect. And then, uh, Tim, just closing question that I ask every guest, but if you just had one piece of advice for the audience, maybe it was your biggest takeaway through your whole wellness journey. But if you just had one piece of advice to give, what would it be? Um, We'll do, we'll do one with a little addendum. Okay. So, <laughs> Sounds good. I, Cause I get this a lot and I want to say like my mantra is eat plants, move your body. All you got to do is a little more than you did yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, and that sounds real cliche, but the truth is nothing is going to matter. Change is not going to be possible. Sustainable change is not going to be possible until you can look in the mirror and start loving yourself enough to know that you're worth changing. And that sounds so hippie-ish. Like no, and if you no, I love it. That five years ago, I would have threw a hamburger at you. But <laughs> it's true. Um, until until you realize that you're worth fighting for, it's it's all just rituals, you know? Yeah. No, I love that. I love that. It's amazing. And Tim, thank you so much for taking time to come on. I loved having you. And I'm just excited to share your story with people. And I know all the work you're doing is going to change so many lives. So just thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to today's episode. I hope you loved my conversation with Tim. His story is so inspiring and I'm just excited for you guys to follow him on social media to keep up with everything that he's doing. You can find the social media links that we talked about in the episode in the show notes, but you can also find them on my site at drcaseyjohnson.com. That's D-R-K-A-S-E-Y, johnson.com. Click on the Listen tab. Then from there, you'll be able to see all of the past guests that have come on the Unlock Wellness podcast, read a little bit more about each guest, and be able to click on their social media links, websites, all of that. So all of Tim's information can be found on my website as well. If you guys loved today's episode with Tim, be sure to jump onto iTunes, subscribe, and write a review. It really helps me out a lot, and I really appreciate all of the feedback and support. And like I spoke about in the intro, also be sure to check out my first children's book of my Healthy Children's Book series called Maddox's Trip to the Chiropractor. Each purchase of the book supports the Unlock Wellness Project, which supplies a wellness bag to a child in need for each book purchased. You can learn more about the book and the Unlock Wellness Project on my website as well at drcaseyjohnson.com. Click on the Shop tab and choose the Children's Book option. You'll be able to read a short description and even watch a short video to learn more. If you do purchase the book, be sure to share it on social media using the hashtag UWProject. I'll repost it and give you a shout out on the podcast. But I hope you guys love the book. Thank you so much for the support and I hope you love today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in.